ripped straight from recent headlines comes Robert B. Parker's Someone to Watch Over Me, which is the latest thriller novel in his popular detective series. Serious Parker fans will recall the 1980s TV series Spencer for Hire, featuring actor Robert Urich, based on Parker's novels. Parker passed away in 2010, but his iconic Boston private eye, Spencer, lives on in the books written by fellow author Ace Atkins, as a request by Parker's wife, Joan. I was already an established crime writer on my own. She said, let me send you some of Bob's books and you can kind of get familiar. And I said, I am a lifelong uh, Robert B. Parker fan. I am a Spencer fanatic. I said, uh, let me get started today. Ten years later, Atkins continues writing the Spencer series, with one becoming a movie called Spencer Confidential, featuring Spencer? actor Mark Wahlberg, loosely now? based on Atkins' novel, Wonderland. Spencer, this is Hawk. As with every Parker novel, Atkins retains the crisp and crusty exchanges between Spencer and his sidekick, Hawk. The mutual devotion the P.I. shares with his true love, Susan Silverman, and Spencer's special blend, doing the right thing with a smart, wise-cracking attitude. They thought part of the success was keeping the stories contemporary and keeping Spencer a contemporary character. But other than that, um, I think they've been really wonderful about trusting me with this, with this legacy. Spencer's latest case in Someone to Watch Over Me includes his resourceful young protege, Maddie Sullivan, who recruits him to help destroy a sex ring full of powerful big shots convinced they're above the law. The storyline may sound familiar. We're billionaire Jeffrey Epstein and accused pedophile uh, who was found dead in prison and his ex-girlfriend Elaine Maxwell. Are they the inspiration for this storyline? Of, of course. <laughs> the Epstein story just got larger and larger, and the way it was connected with power brokers, and the way that this guy was able to operate with cases being thrown out and with police actually being harassed for trying to make a case against this man. It was too much of a story that I to pass up. Each year, the former newspaper crime reporter writes a novel of his own, adding to his nearly two dozen published books and one Robert B. Parker Spencer novel. Atkins says he wanted to be a crime novelist since he was a teen when he cracked open his first Parker book. What made the Parker books different it is it's really the humor. And I always knew any time that I was going to pick up a Parker book when I was going to read a Spencer novel that I was going to have fun. It was going to make me laugh. And there was a good story that was going to be driving things. But I think that's what sets him apart from the other. Uh, that's what I've learned as a novelist and something I do in my other books is I try to bring humor to the table. And uh, especially the days we're living in right now, we need a good laugh. Ace Actons, thank you for joining us. And for our viewers and listeners, a reminder that you can purchase a copy of Someone to Watch Over Me at Left Bank Books. So I want to get that out right away and remind them to visit our local stores and patronize them. But Left Bank Books is open and pick up a copy of Someone to Watch Over Me. Again, we're interviewing Ace Atkins, the author of this latest book. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Victoria. It's good to be here, even virtually. I wish I was there in person, but we're doing the best we can these days. I know. Now, although you hail from Alabama, you now live in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, you are familiar with St. Louis. I, did I read that in the 70s? You and your uh, family? In the there? 80s, uh, my father was, um, was a football coach for the old uh, uh, St. Louis Cardinals, and I lived for a long time in, in Chesterfield. And uh, so I've got really wonderful memories of, of St. Louis. And that's why I always enjoy every year coming back to the city and visiting and then seeing old places and, and hopefully we'll return very soon. Right. Any fond memories you have? Uh, the St. Louis Zoo. Uh, uh, I love the, uh, is it uh, uh, lion's share roast beef? Uh, you know. I don't and, know if that's still around anymore. Oh, just, I love that. Uh, the old, uh, Bush Stadium, you know, um, great places. And I, I'm trying to think, uh, Jack, Jackie Smith, the old football player, used to have a great place where you used to get great wings. I think it was called Sportsman's Park. Uh, but yeah, great city. I, I, I miss it a lot. Yes. I mean, there's so much going on and we're just hoping we can get back to some, uh, well, at least baseball Cardinal games. Um, yep. I, since the Cardinals uh, football flew the coop many years ago, I guess oh, that's yeah. what made you move. Is that after you moved, then you moved on to... Uh, yeah, my, yeah, my dad was a coach, coach here in the early 
uh, early eighties. Um, I don't know when the first move, when the, when they first left, um, the city, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of falling apart at that time. <laughs> so it was uh, late the last 80s. day. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Late eighties. Uh, when they moved, um, Ace Atkins is a great name. That is not a pseudonym, is it? No, it's not. It's funny. A lot of people ask me that when I, when I do book talks, they want to know what my real name is. And, you know, a lot of authors do have pen names, but no, my, my father, uh, with his connection to the NFL and being a uh, pro football player, he was the original Ace Atkins. And so I was named after my dad. Uh, but yeah, people often think that it was something I made up, even going back to my days as being a, uh, a newspaper reporter, they thought there's no way a guy could be named Ace, but it, it's true. It's just great. It's a great name for an author, a football player. We're going to get into your background in a little sure, bit, sure. but I do want to get into this book. Now, Ace, I may have miscounted. I'm telling you, I did this twice. Okay. <laughs> Math is not my strong point, but I tallied uh, 25 books you've written, including your Quinn Colson series, Nick Travers series. You have four standalones and now the Spencer series, which is part of the late author, Robert B. Parker's, as we see here, uh, uh, theories and novels that he's, he wrote uh, when he was alive. Please explain what this means. Um, but be well, before we do that, tell us who Robert B. Parker was and how it came to be that now you're writing, uh, continuing his work. Sure, Parker was one of my heroes. When I, when I got into the kind of books that I wanted to write and then I really wanted to become an author, uh, he was one of my uh, main inspirations. Uh, I, I loved his work. He created, of course, the Spencer character that's been around as long as pretty much I've been alive. I think the first book was published in 1972. And uh, as a young person, as a teenager, I love these books about a kind of a smart aleck private detective in Boston his adventures. Uh, they have a very uh, literary style to them. They're, they're much, uh, you know, if people think of them, they're, they're not Mickey Splane. They're very, very, uh, I think, highbrow detective reads. And I, and I just thought they were fantastic. I thought they were very funny. I thought the humor set uh, uh, Mr. Parker's work uh, apart from everything. And that's the kind of books I wanted to write um, as, a, as a young person, what I wanted to get into. So when Mr. Parker uh, passed away in 2010, uh, it became known shortly after that, that his family, in particular, his uh, wife, Joan, wanted to keep Spencer going in some of his other creations. And I was fortunate enough to have been chosen by uh, Joan Parker, who, who later became a wonderful friend, and some uh, family members from the Parker, that, that are part of the Parker estate. And I've been doing it now for almost 10 years. So they sought you out. Well, it was, yeah, I was, I was asked, I was one of the, I don't know how many authors it was. I was, I was asked uh, if I would be interested in uh, submitting 50 pages and they were looking at some different authors and um, the, the editor at the time had been uh, Bob's longtime editor, a woman named Chris Pepe, another good friend of mine who has become a friend of mine. And she said, uh, do you need to prep for this? Uh, you know, I was already a, an established crime writer on my own. She said, let me send you some of Bob's books and you can kind of get familiar. And I said, I am a lifelong uh, Robert B. Parker fan. I am a Spencer fanatic. I said, uh, let me get started today. And I started writing the, uh, what became the, the novel Lullaby, uh, sent the, the first 50 pages in. And a short time later, which is around Christmas, uh, 2010, uh, Chris Pepe let me know that they had unanimously chosen my work to continue on uh, Bob's legacy. And in that same vein then, so when you're writing the book, like the most one we're going to talk about in a moment, Someone to Watch Over Me, do they, does the estate have the right for like a final edit? They they do, but uh, the, the, they've been really great. It, um, Joan passed away a few years ago and she was a wonderful friend and a champion of my work and somebody that I bounced ideas off of and someone who really helped me understand the character of Spencer more than just being a fan, but really to understand it the way that her husband did. Uh, but no, they, they trust me to do this. And so it's been a wonderful, it really has been a wonderful relationship for the last 10 years, uh, keeping Spencer going. I think there were some kind of parameters. Uh, really the only thing that was expressed to me was to keep Spencer contemporary. Yeah. Um, at first I had the idea to, to kind of go back to the seventies or the eighties and write at the period uh, that, that was really the zenith of, of Bob's writing, but they thought part of the success was keeping the stories contemporary and keeping Spencer a contemporary character. But other than that, um, I think they've been really wonderful about trusting me with this, with this legacy. Well, you have kept it contemporary in the latest one, Someone to Watch Over Me. Uh, I have to ask this, we're a billionaire, Jeffrey Epstein and 
accused pedophile uh, who was found dead in prison and his ex-girlfriend, Elaine Maxwell, were they the inspiration for this storyline? Of, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. It was like right out of the headlines, baby. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, this goes back to my work uh, as being a newspaper reporter, and, and I was cover I covered the crime beat uh, for a number of years for the Tampa Tribune, and I was in Central Florida. That was my job when I got out of college, and so I'm always going to the news for fodder of great stories. I find that to be the best, uh, you know, the, the best material for me to mine. And you just couldn't stay away from the Epstein story. The Epstein story just got larger and larger and the way it was connected with power brokers and the way that this guy was able to operate with cases being thrown out and with police actually being harassed for trying to make a case against this man, having a DA toss out, you know, have any type of, you know, remorse for what he's done. It, you know, it was, it was just, it was too much of a story that I to, to pass up. I can see this being put into a movie. I know you're a Burt Reynolds fan, but he obviously no longer with us. So, and too old for the part, but uh, yeah. yeah. So I can yeah. see that. Uh, Burt actually, Burt years ago actually was the uh, reader for the audio books. He did four or five of the books. I think in his back of his mind, he always wanted to play Spencer. Probably. I saw somewhere you wrote a letter to Burt. I did. I was supposed to interview Bert some months around when he died. And I was working on a project and he actually had just been cast in the new Quentin Tarantino movie. And it just was not the right timing, but we planned afterwards to get together. And he was actually a big reader, but uh, Bert loved crime novels. And he actually was a friend of Robert Parker's. Uh, they actually created a TV show together called BL Striker that was uh, in the late eighties. It was a terrific show. And so he loved Parker's work and he read the continuations of the novels and we became friendly just through, you know, letter exchanges and emails and that kind of thing. But unfortunately, um, didn't have a chance to meet him. And, and I wrote an essay about him for Garden and Gun magazine and, and how much I, I loved his work and I loved his humor. Yes, it was, it was well written and how it, he was such a part of your family, really, unwittingly. Yes. Um, let's talk about the book, Someone to Watch Over Me. So we've already hinted that it has everything got to do with the pedophile accused pedophile Jeffrey Epstein, who took his own life. We will say you follow some of the truth, but the ending's a little different than real life. So that's right. all I'm gonna say, no spoilers here. Um, so you've got Spencer, the Boston PI, and now he's got his young protege, Maddie, with him. Can you take it from there for me? Sure, Maddie Sullivan was a character that I came up with in the first Spencer novel that I wrote 10 years ago. Again, I've always been influenced by real life. The main thing that I told the estate that I promised Joan Parker is I would never write a Spencer novel that was just a, a read because Spencer was in it, that it was something that you would be reading because it was just a boring uh, mystery and then Spencer livened things up. I wanted my criteria for every Spencer novel that I've written to be an exciting story that could stand on its own, even if the investigator or the hero's name was John Smith. And so um, I had come across a story uh, helping out this group in town called the Innocence Project um, about a young woman who had uh, her, lost her mother when she was just 10 years old, 10 or 11 years old. And there had been a man that had been arrested. He was actually on death row here in Mississippi. But the daughter was convinced that this man was innocent. And she believed the man that was spending time on death row had actually not killed her mother and that the real killer was still out there. And just that idea had stuck with me. Uh, and it really, you know, I knew I wanted to write a novel about it. And so when it came to me write the first Spencer novel, that's the story I, I chose to, to tell um, uh, in the book Lullaby. Um, and that, that young girl was Maddie Sullivan. And so now 10 years on writing this story, I thought, what is Maddie like as a young adult? And I've mentioned her in some of the other Spencer novels, and I've mentioned that she occasionally does a little legwork for, for Spencer and that she's in, interested in someday, you know, getting into law enforcement or becoming an investigator herself. But uh, I just wanted to see what, I wanted to revisit this character. I liked her a great deal. And so this is uh, the, the genesis for this entire novel, uh, Someone to Watch Over Me, is about a friend of Maddie's who has been harassed, has had a run-in with, with this Je Jeffrey Epstein-like character. Right. So Maddie has a bigger role in this one, no doubt. Yeah, she's a, she's, a uh, she's one of the main players. She's yeah. one of the main players in this book. Uh, I think she deserves her own spinoff series. I really like her a great deal. I really like the repartee between Hawk and Spencer. And, and it's, it's just, like I said earlier, contemporary. It's fun. It moves fast. It made it a pleasure to read in the midst of a very disturbing story. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a disturbing story. I mean, the Epstein story is disturbing, but I think that there is moments of humor, I think, is what really drives these stories. And I was talking to somebody recently about this, the, the success of what made Parker different, what made the Parker books different. It is 
things. It's really the humor. And I always knew anytime that I was going to pick up a Parker book, when I was going to read a Spencer novel, that I was going to have fun. It was going to make me laugh. And there was a good story that was going to be driving things. But I think that's what sets him apart from the other. Uh, that's what I've learned as a novelist and something I do in my other books is I try to bring humor to the table. And uh, especially the days we're living in right now, we need a good laugh. Isn't that the truth? That's so true. <laughs> a little bit about your background. By the time you were 30, you've been a crime reporter for the Tampa Bay Tribune. I think you mentioned that, Tampa Tribune. You've been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for your crime reporting and published two crime no novels. Do you take the time at all to look back and say, wow, I accomplished quite a bit by the time I was 30? Oh, well, that's not, that's very nice. You know, I, I very rarely look back. I, I You know, sometimes I go back to those earlier novels and really what I do is I wish I could write them over again. There's things that I have learned uh, very much over the last 20 years on how to do, uh, how to, how to do them better, how to, how to create a, a better story. Um, but I really was at a young age, very much into these kind of books. And I, again, going back to Robert B. Parker, I credit him and Elmore Leonard with being my main influences. And, and most people, you know, You'd ask, what do you want to do for a living? You know, whether it be a doctor or a lawyer or business guy or whatever, is I wanted to be a crime novelist. And I knew that from probably the time I was 18, 19 years old. I mean, you talk about others that influenced you as well. Um, you really like the, well, I know you like the blues and I know that you uh, put a lot of your Southern traditions into your books and Elvis Presley, it was a part sure. of your series. Yeah. Um, James Bond also had a great influence. Explain that. Yeah, it's, um, I, really, I think the books have really caught fire to me. And, and again, you know, I go back to, you know, the importance of library systems. I mean, I think when I was living at, uh, you know, going back even with my school library, when I was living in Chesterfield and, you know, checking out books and, and discovering new books, I, I hope kids still have the excitement of that. I don't, I don't think you have that excitement in the digital age of downloading something. I think finding something in the library was a great excitement. And I found Ian Fleming at a very uh, early age. And I had been a reader, but I wouldn't say a, you know, voracious reader. I wasn't necessarily, you know, just one of those kids that was reading a book all the time. But by, by the time I was about 14 or 15, I discovered Ian Fleming. And those books really just set fire to my imagination. And I just, I love the travel log. I love the, the detail. I loved all of it. And uh, it, that was the really my gateway, gateway into becoming just a, uh, a lover of books. Well, speaking of that, I read in a couple of places that, um, while you were a star football player at Auburn, by the way. And I, was a foot, I was a football player. Star may be a little bit gracious. Okay. But then. You were on the cover of Sports Illustrated, unless I read that wrong. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Back in the, was it the 90s, I think? Back right? in the 90s, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so local local star hero there in Auburn. Majored in screenwriting. So again, you took your love of reading into writing. But I read that a coach once took a book right out of your hand. <laughs> and that you enrolled in a creative writing class and they rejected you or didn't accept you or whatever they didn't do they that's true i you know i, I the, the the coaches were not exactly the most uh, many of them were not uh, some of them were but many of them were the most cerebral literate people that i knew <laughs> uh and again that kind of goes back to my appreciation of spencer is you know spencer was a, a former college football player uh he had been an athlete uh but he loved uh reading he loved uh poetry he loved uh art he loved good music and i you know and it was really something that spoke to me is that you could be all those things you could be a physical person you could be a uh you know but yet somebody who who loves uh you know to 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 study uh, and, and make themselves better. You do write about what you know. I mean, that's very common for any writer, but what you're comfortable with. So your Southern roots are definitely there, your traditions, football is in a lot of these stories. Sure. How much research do you do for those books? And going back to your crime writing days uh, and Pulitzer nominated days as a crime reporter, do you put a lot of research into these? Well, it depends on the story. I mean, I, I did a series of books. I did four books that were really heavily based on actual events. I did a story that was um, about Tampa in the 1950s and a famous murder that had happened there. And I, I turned it into a novel. And I did the same thing with a very popular, very interesting case in, in 1920 San Francisco involving a silent movie star named Roscoe Arbuckle and about his uh, trial. It was really the, one of the biggest first movie star scandals in America. So that was a lot of research. I mean, I, I, I would go through uh, court cases and uh, old newspapers and and you know it just I would spend six to seven months just researching the novel before I'd start to write mm -hmm. however you know on something like someone to watch over me uh, you know it really came down to kind of you know getting familiar with the Epstein case and then 
trying to forget all of it and trying to make it into something completely different. You know, I, I didn't spend it. I didn't want to be that close to the case because I wanted it just to be just to influence it, just to inspire the story. And the idea of somebody getting away with these crimes uh, and a horrific person like Epstein, it just, that's once I kind of got a handle on it, then I was able to make it my own. Right, right, certainly. Well, since you studied screenwriting back in college, did you have a chance to collaborate when your book uh, Wonderland became uh, the film Spencer Confidential? That's for folks who don't know, Mark Wahlberg starred in it. Most I had uh, I had nothing to do uh, with the production at all. There was a lot of liberties taken with the script. I think for Spencer readers, it's a very different take on that world. It's not like, I don't know if you remember the TV show with Robert Urich, which was much more faithful to the book, but um, I did visit the set. I was in Boston a couple of years ago and the, the producers were very nice to me and I sat on the set and I watched them uh, film some fist fights and car chases and that kind of stuff and uh, got a nice lunch. But no, I didn't have anything to do with the, the writing of that script. But now let's fast forward. You have collaborated with HBO with your Quinn Colson series, correct? No, I, you know, it was a collaboration. Uh, uh, HBO bought uh, the Quinn Colson books oh. that, are, that are like Spencer, but not like Spencer. This, this is a different world. This is about a sheriff in, uh, in the, the Deep South and in Mississippi. So they're, they're certainly, you know, the people who like Parker would enjoy these books, but very different kind of character and very different world. And HBO uh, last year purchased the rights to all the novels. And uh, there's, a, there's a TV show, TV series, you know, uh, that was in high development before the pandemic. And now we're kind of in a, in a holding pattern these days, but still very exciting news. And they're, they're very hopeful that this will get made. So you're not doing any writing for that at all? No screen. No, writing. I'm not. It's uh, the producer, the director is he's actually doing the uh, uh, has been working on the scripts, but it is a, I, I'm very excited about it. I, I know that it's been a, it's going to be a very faithful adaptation to the books. And that's for, for a writer. That's the best you can hope for. So who would you have Spencer be and someone to watch over me if it were made into a film or TV series or anything? Who would you like to see who's contemporary these days? Oh, so many of the people, you know, they used to ask that same question to Bob Parker. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, he, he always, you know, he'd always name a, a dead actor. <laughs> you know, so, so <laughs> you know, you know, you ask me and I've got a name, you know, Burt Reynolds or, you know, yeah. something like that. Right. Uh, but uh, somebody contemporary, it'd have to be somebody, you know, a uh, larger person, somebody who's very physical. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, this day and age, so many, you know, I, I always like, you know, James Garner, those kind of guys. Um, yeah. I don't know who would be the equivalent to that. Um, well, just his humor, in my mind, was, I saw Mel Gibson, but he's too old now, too. Yeah, so. he's got a, and, and Mel's got a lot of baggage on him these <laughs> he's got days. got a lot of baggage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, <laughs> Mel's, got, <laughs> Mel's not on the, the, the hit list for any no, producers yeah. these days. I don't know. Somebody like George Clooney. Would... George Clooney, he's got that kind of sense of humor. I, I would agree. So Ace, you used to teach at the University of Mississippi at Oxford, I believe journalism, is that correct? That's right. right. What advice did you give your young reporters or writers and, and what, what do you give advice do you give to folks now? Well, you know, I, I love journalism and it was, it's really very much like uh, what Spencer does, which is getting to the truth. And I, you know, I wanted to be a reporter because I admired that about uh, getting to the truth, calling out facts, bringing to attention the, you know, the criminals, people like uh, Jeffrey Epstein that got called actually uh, the light shed on him because of some terrific reporting done by the Miami Herald. And so being an investigator, I think that's what I tried to instill in the young writers, which is, you know, being a reporter is not just repeating what somebody tells you or doing it an interview being a good reporter is being like a private investigator it's digging for facts digging for the truth and these days you know unfortunately i got to see the demise of, of newspapers and got to see a demise in a lot of investigative reporting and we're kind of entering a i think a golden age of corruption where people are able to you know work uh you know without without newspapers checking checking things over or being a watchdog for society so it, in short that's what i tried to inspire young people to do and it's it's hard because the jobs aren't out there like they used to be so a reminder to all of our viewers and our listeners to pick up a hard copy of uh, Ace Atkins, Someone to Watch Over Me. You can go to Left Bank Books in St. Louis or check out their website as well. And Ace, you mentioned something else coming up in the works. When can we get your next novel? I have a new book coming out this summer in July called The Heathens, which is a Quinn Colson novel. Uh, very different from Someone to Watch Over Me, uh, set in deep Mississippi, and uh, very excited about that book. Thank you, Ace Atkins. We appreciate your time today. Thank you, Victoria.